Before we begin, let me take a moment to introduce our panel. Each one's areas of content expertise, I believe, brings great depth to this webinar. Whether it's telehealth, readmissions, obviously clinical utility and safety, they all have a unique perspective to share. First, Dr. Peter Pronovost. Dr. Pronovost currently serves as the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer for University Hospitals of Cleveland, a $4.5 billion comprehensive integrative health system. Many of us know Dr. Pronovost as a world-renowned patient safety champion, innovator, critical care physician, prolific researcher, and entrepreneur. But in addition to this, his scientific work, leveraging checklists to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections, has saved thousands of lives and earned him high-profile accolades. Dr. Pronovost also serves as a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at Case Western and their School of Nursing as well. Dr. Pronovost is also a fellow of the National Academy of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Pronovost. Next, Jody Murray. Jody is manager of the Advanced Practice Providers at Baptist Health in South Florida. Florida. She's a family and adult acute care nurse practitioner and manages the acute practice providers across their system. She leads several quality initiatives within Baptist Health, including working with their health team on the deployment of the Massimo Safety Net from July 2020 to the present time. Welcome, Jody. Next, welcome Sarah Brace. Sarah is the readmissions clinical analysis person at Luminous Health and Arundel Medical Center in Annapolis, Maryland. There, Sarah manages several hospital transition programs and strategies. Most recently, she has worked with both inpatient and ambulatory leaders to institute remote patient monitoring for COVID-positive patients, transitioning to them to home after a hospital stay. Her passion for preventing readmissions is rooted in her background as a cardiac ICU nurse and was also a Fold Fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, and she also practiced at, at Johns Hopkins as well in their ICU. Welcome, Sarah. And Mitchell Fong. Mitch's background includes representing telemedicine and projecting that for underserved populations and communities across the country. He has master's degrees in both public health and business administration. He's the director of telemedicine at Renown Health, a not-for-profit integrated health system serving northern Nevada, Lake Tahoe, and northeast California. Mitch's prior experience in data analytics, quality utilization management, and his passion and expertise in that arena has helped expand access to timely care for communities in both rural and urban settings. Welcome, Mitch. And from the Massimo team, Devesh Manava. Devesh is director of our product marketing and automation systems here at Massimo. He leads our efforts across those automation technologies, including the patient safety net systems. He'll be providing updates today with regard to the system, including a demonstration and slides to accompany that. Before I turn the discussion to our panelists, next slide please, I thought I would do a brief level, level setting for context. First, we can all agree that COVID-19 is an unprecedented health challenge. The need to address demand via surge capacity initiatives is ongoing across hospitals across the country and in fact the world. But we see that this goes beyond conventional surge issues that you might see in a busy ED, requiring rapid transitions of non-monitored space to monitored space to meet the demands of increased acuity. Also, out-of-hospital, non-clinical venues, all the way up to parking lots and field hospitals. And of course, in the home. But in those settings, how do you maintain the standard of medical and clinical grade technology that our clinicians rely upon? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Next slide. This has truly been a historic week uh, triumphant when you think about the vaccine's approval and the first US recipient to receive it but also, tragically, the 300,000 virus fatality here in the U.S. These record high deaths, the increase in hospitalizations, over 20,000 people in our nation's ICUs, over 6,000 individuals on ventilators, it's not abating. With vaccine approval, the United States is about to bark upon what is perhaps the first phase of the largest mass vaccination in history. But this will take time. With the upcoming holiday seasons, gatherings of family and friends, the increased travel, the number of cases are expected to increase. Next slide, please. How is Massimo uniquely positioned to address this challenge and what will follow? First, our history. Clinicians have 
relied on our clinical solutions in the most complex of patient care environments. From surgical services, intensive care units, neonatal intensive care, we've been there. But also we're a global medical technology company, a history of innovation in non-invasive continuous monitoring, solving the unsolvable challenges in pulse oximetry and clinical monitoring, and today it goes beyond that. We're in over 150 countries. We're in nine of the top 10 U.S. News and World Report hospitals, serving over 200 million patients worldwide. And with respect to COVID-19, our response has been tremendous, serving over 165 hospitals and health systems in their unique way of meeting this demand and in partnership with them to bring those patients home and restore them to health. All of this has gone beyond traditional hospital settings. Obviously, I mentioned hospital to home, non-traditional and, and alternate venues like field hospitals and parking lots. But what's the next stage? It's gonna be chronic care management, chronic diseases, post-surgical care, wellness, the identification of opioid-induced respiratory depression. These are all on the horizon. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna turn it to Devesh, who's going to give us a brief demonstration of the Massimo Safety Net platform. Devesh? Thanks, Rick. Uh, when COVID-19 hit, we uh, accelerated our efforts here at Massimo to bring true hospital-grade measurements into uh, the home and other areas outside of the hospital. We did that by taking our wireless uh, wearable sensor, Radius PPG, which is a wearable pulse oximetry sensor, uh, and making that available outside of the hospital. This sensor allows us to monitor a patient's oxygen saturation, pulse rate, perfusion index, plaque variability, and our patient's respiration rate. To take this sensor out of the hospital, we created a mobile application called the Massimo Safety Net app. This mobile application allows us to pair this wearable pulse oximetry sensor as well as our wearable temperature sensor and bring all that data into the app. The app also features digital care programs that are set up by clinicians to allow patients to enter in any symptoms or any other experiences they may be having. Together, all this data from our sensors and the care program are sent into the secure Massimo cloud. From there, it goes down to any web-enabled PC into a dashboard for clinicians to monitor their patients wherever they are. At this dashboard, clinicians can not only see all their patients, they can see all of their data, as well as receive any alert should any threshold be crossed on the sensor or on those, those inputs uh, from the care program. So this is Massimo Safety Net, a cloud-based solution that requires little to no infrastructure, can be deployed rapidly, and brings true hospital-grade measurements to the home. Uh, as Rick mentioned, we've deployed this at over 165 hospitals uh, and health systems around the world uh, who are using this for COVID-19 and so much more. We've got a great set of panelists here to talk about some of their experiences using this. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Rick. Thanks, Devesh, for that overview, incredibly comprehensive, and again, sets the context. With that, I'm going to turn to our panelists, and I want to start with Dr. Pronovost. And I thought, Dr. Pronovost, if I could take advantage as the take moderator. Advantage as the moderator. Ask you just uh, ask you to just uh, frame your uh, remarks uh, along two lines. First, your experience leading uh, your institution in the deployment and, and the refinement of of this system. And secondly, you moderated our initial panel, our first webinar. What is the current state of play from that time till today? The progress made, et cetera. Love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, great and. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Rick, and for Massimo for hosting this. You know, this year saw unprecedented suffering, but it also saw unprecedented innovation. And this Massimo product and with healthcare is a brilliant example of one of those, Rick. We went, as you may remember, on March 16th or 17th from emergency FDA approval to the first patient four days later on March 21st. So now at UH, we have monitored over 1,400 patients. Those are 1,400 people who would have been admitted otherwise who were safely cared for at home. And your point is, how did we get there? Well, no doubt we need to trust the technology. And part of the buy-in from our clinicians was that trust in the reliability and the accuracy of your pulse oximeter, particularly because 
so many of them have so many false positives that they're, they're, the clinicians just don't trust them. But more importantly was the agile innovation and co-development that occurred where the Masano engineers and our team in the beginning literally had twice a day huddles, but Bilal, Joe Kiani, the CEO, were all on those calls, as were our team. We would surface issues. Your engineers would go build, build it and redesign it. We would deploy it. We would test and get our, our hands dirty. And that's the way we have a product that is so easy to use now and so impactful. And, and that innovation hasn't stopped. We routinely are on the horn with your team about seeing this you know, kind of opportunity. Um, the way we do it now, Rick, is we deploy this from the ED or from the uh, hospital discharge. We also discharge it directly from our home health to people at home, usually on the order triggered by our primary care clinicians. People are monitored centrally by nurses. The nurses call twice a day. We have algorithms of who needs to go back to the ED, who might need 911 triggered, and uh, it is just a delight for patients. They're, they're extremely satisfied. And almost daily, Rick, we're thinking of new use cases of keeping non-COVID patients out of the hospital and also matching technologies to the patient's needs where we have stood up literally a whole new service line called rem home remonitoring where we're looking at, you know, what types of patients does the disposable need uh, which type of patients might we use w one of your uh, other non-disposable technologies because people are going to look at it more. Which patients need continuous monitoring? Which ones do we couple this with telemedicine? And w which ones might be okay with intermittent monitoring? So bottom line is, Rick, we're now over 1,400 patients that would have been admitted. It's incredibly safe for patients. They love it. Our clinicians love it in part because You've built the system to, to be so reliable and easy to use. And I think this is the beginning of a literally a whole new service line and approach to, to medicine. We're working on what exactly are the quality measures that we're following. We're publishing our initial results to share some of the, the percentages of people who go back to the hospital, which in our case, it looks like it's around 10%. But I think this is a solution that every hospital needs to consider because as you've seen the curves now, we're predicted to peak in this country in mid-January with our COVID cases. They're likely to double or triple um, from where they are now. Then we're already three times higher than we were in the spring. So that was kind of like training wheels, but we're so much more comforted in knowing we can do it safely because we have this technology and more importantly, we're using this technology. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Dr. Pronovost. Uh, not only what you've done uh, historically, but what you're doing right now with the platform there at uh, University Hospital is uh, fantastic. Can't wait to see what's around the corner. What's around the corner. Rick, Rick, I can tell you just for context, right now at this moment, we have 64 people monitored continuously. Wow. Fantastic. That's great. Well, let's go on to our next uh, presentation, and I'm happy now to introduce uh, Jody Murray uh, from Baptist Health of South Florida. She's going to share her experiences and also Baptist experience across their hospital system with respect to continuous monitoring of those patients discharged. Jody? Hi, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, as Rich mentioned, my name is Jody Murray. I am one of the manager of advanced providers at Baptist Health South Florida, and I'm also one of the clinical leads for quality initiatives within our organization. So it's a pleasure and honor to be here to tell you about my experience during the pandemic, as well as my experience with uh, initiating Massimo uh, Safety Net during this time. Um, next slide, please. In addition to myself, there were several other um, team members that participated in the rollout of this program. Uh, number one being Dr. Jonathan Fialco, who's our chief of cardiology, as well as several other clinical leads and also several other operational leads. You can see that it was definitely a team-based approach in rolling out this program. Next slide, please. And uh, we ask, why Massimo? Well, for several reasons. I will tell you, during the pandemic has been a, a big challenge for us. 
um, we as an organization wanted to look for a program that would provide patients with care that was not only safe but also innovative. Uh, Massimo was one of those devices that did that, or one of those programs that was able to provide that. Um, the device was FDA approved, uh, so that's a big thing for us here at Baptist Health. We wanted to make sure that this was a credible uh, device that we could use on our patients and they could feel comfort in knowing that. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted to alleviate the COVID-19 surge. And what that means is that we wanted to really decompress our emergency rooms and our hospital overall. Now, we were able to discharge patients who we were somewhat on the fence about, perhaps patients needing a little bit of oxygen um, and who could go home and be monitored safely. In addition to this, it gave the patients a lot of reassurance in knowing that they were able to recover in their own home. As you know, with COVID-19, many patients complain about the fact that they have that social isolation and feeling that they're alone most of the time. So this gave them the opportunity to still be in the presence of family while quarantining in a separate area of their home. And that was very important to us because at the end of the day, the reason why we're here as an organization is for that patient-centered care. Um, it also allowed for us to monitor our patients 24-7 um, by dedicated staff. One of the questions our patients would often ask us was who would be monitoring? That was a concern for them. And when we let them know that we, Baptist Health, the organization that they trust and know was going to be the one monitoring them, they were very pleased uh, to find that information. In addition to this, we were able to monitor patients daily and provide timely interventions. So we had to be able to send patients back to the emergency room if needed. We had to assess whether they had fever, temperature uh, changes, or any type of heart rate fluctuations. And with that, we were able to either do wellness checks and or ask them to come back to the emergency room. So again, another added benefit and another added uh, reassurance for the patient. Next slide, please. One of the important things to our patients was that, you know, they asked us, well, what does this mean? If I'm going to be monitored at home, what type of, what type of device do I need or what type of machine would this be like? The simplest thing for them to know was that there would be no limitations in their activities of daily, daily living. So they would be able to use their phone, they would still have full arm mobility, and they would still be able to carry on with their daily activities with the exception of being quarantined, of course. Um, but that was also some reassurance. Uh, for those patients. So it was definitely a, a great impact uh, for us. Next slide, please. This here is our provider pocket guide reference. This is actually an internal use, and we have used this, again, uh, to monitor our patients. And for those patients that were suspicious PUIs um, or COVID-positive patients, we were using this actual protocol on. The patients had to be clinically stable with no severe respiratory distress symptoms. And the way we decided to identify these patients was a provider would identify the patient, that being the nurse practitioner, physician, et cetera. They would enter the order in our EHR, which is Cerner. The RN would then initiate the process and place the device on the patient. Our monitoring area would monitor the patients for 12 days maximum. And then they would, again, reassess the patients for any clinical deterioration. And if that was needed, we could, again, uh, initiate a wellness check and or send them back to the emergency room if needed. And one of the great things about this process was that it was accessible with home oxygen. So our patients who required three liters or less, we were able to connect them with this device and also send them home and eventually wean them off. So they would also be connected with a wellness check at about three days into the process to make sure that they were going to be able to transition to their previous state of health. Next slide, please. And this is our more stringent criteria. Again, the inclusion included suspected COVID-19 patients, any confirmed COVID patients. We did a, a brief eligibility screen. And what that means is we had to make sure that our patients had a smartphone, they had available support, and that the patient and or the support person understands how to use the app and are able to dial 911 in the event of an emergency. Um, some of our exclusion criteria included uh, altered mental status, critically ill, of course, and if the patient did not have any eligible uh, available support and or required oxygen more than three liters, we would not include these patients in uh, the criteria for obvious reasons. Um, next slide, please. 
Now, here are some success stories. We've had several over the past few months. And again, we initiated this process back in July of 2015, and it has been a great success for our organization. Um, I will tell you, we had one patient in particular that I think none of us here will forget. Uh, this particular patient, uh, young guy, would say 45 years old, he came in and he was discharged with the device. He ended up defatting throughout the night, oxygen in the 70s. We had to bring him back to the hospital. However, the next day when I came back, I noticed that he was still on the dashboard. And when I inquired as to why this gentleman was still here, apparently the gentleman said that, you know, he attributed this device to saving his life and he wasn't going to let go of it. So we were just, you know, we, it's actually a true testament um, to, to the value of having this program in our health system. And although it was, you know, funny for us, it was, it was definitely, um, it paid off in, in the long run in saving for the patient and, and overall health care. Um, another personal story that I can share with you is a, a family friend who ha had called me and she asked me to check on her sister-in-law who was in the ED. And oftentimes, you know, you get these phone calls from people who they know you're in healthcare, so of course they reach out to you and they say, hey, can you take a look at this person for me and just make sure she's okay? And that's what I did. She said she was afraid. She wasn't allowed to have any visitors, obviously, because she has COVID. Um, but I made sure that before she left the hospital, we enrolled her in the program and she placed the Mossimo safety net on her hands. With that being said, later on that evening, she decided she was going to quarantine in Pompano Beach, which is about an hour or so away from our organization. That night, she also decided and we had to send her back to the hospital. And, you know, although she didn't go to one of our organizations, the most important thing was that she went to a hospital where she could be quickly uh, triaged and taken care of appropriately. Um, with that in mind, she ended up being on about five liters of oxygen, had to be hospitalized uh, for several days, um, and she recovered greatly. So we're very thankful for that. And overall, you know, she was very grateful, and we as an organization, again, saw the value in having Massimo Safety Net within our health system. Next slide, please. Now, use by facility, we have several facilities. Again, we're in South Florida near Miami, and um, Baptist Hospital of Miami is our largest facility, and we were the first ones to roll out this process um, in our area. Uh, we have over 700 bed hospitals. Then we went to our smaller facilities, West Kendall Baptist Hospital, Doctors Hospital, South Miami, and we also go down to the Keys where Mariners and Fishermen's is one of our hospitals. Uh, we have several Southern Urgent Care Centers, which we've enrolled patients in this program, and we also have our off-campus emergency department. And as our facilities began to hear about Mossimo, Mossimo, they continue to ask questions. We want to go live next. We want to go live next. And I will tell you, Pending our go-lives, we have Boca Regional Hospital, Bethesda East and West is actually going live this week, and they have shared nothing but fe great feedback um, regarding the program thus far. Uh, we also are pending our Northern Urgent Care Centers, um, so lots more to come uh, with rolling out this process. Next slide, please. Our overall goal for the program, again, back to the patient is safe recovery, uh, reduction of unplanned readmissions, healthcare cost avoidance, and increased patient satisfaction. I will tell you, again, with our patients, we've had over 800 patients enrolled in the program. And if you think about it, average length of stay of about five days, you can do the math and see how much that has saved us and prevented us from having to be in code black, which we've been in for several days um, during the pandemic. So, and, and that's a big issue for us. When we're in code black, we're diverting patients to our sister facilities. So being able to know that we can transition patients safely in the comfort of their own home to an, uh, to a system that where we can monitor them, it's a great benefit. And I have to tell you, we found nothing um, but success with the pro program. Excuse me. Next slide, please. What does the future look like for Baptist and Massimo? I will tell you, I believe the sky is the limit. Um, one of the things that we definitely want to take advantage of is data analytics. We want to look and see, you know, how can we improve? How are our patients doing? What are the patients can we include in the program? Um, we want to look at discharge continuous monitoring beyond COVID-19, because as you know, we're hoping that this will stabilize and we can then look at chronic care management and even things such as hospital at home. We also want to make sure that we look at telehealth opportunities. Um, the overall takeaway from this is what I can tell you is that during this pandemic, one of the major things that we've found is that 
nothing happens without a team-based approach. And it's been this team-based approach between Massimo Baptist Health that has allowed us to take our organization to the next level of innovation and patient safety. So I wanna thank you again, Rich, for having me and providing you with this information. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, that incredible presentation. This saves the uh, narratives associated with those success stories, absolutely compelling. I also think the, the pocket guide, uh, using the provider's pocket guide as a point of interface between the Massimo safety net uh, and your hospital system, I think allows you to also capture some of those data points that are going to be so important when we measure clinical outcomes downrange. Really fantastic. Thank you so much. Now let's go to our next slide, our next speaker. We have Sarah Brace from Luminous Health. Sarah, uh, bring us up to date on what's happening there at Luminous and Anne Arundel. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I'm, this is probably the, the, the time of day that I've been looking forward to all day. Um, I love talking about remote patient monitoring. Um, we at Luminous Health, um, and you'll, you'll hear me uh, kind of vacillate between calling us Luminous Health and Anne Arundel Medical Center. Um, we're in the process of a merger, but our parent company is Luminous Health. So if I screw that up, uh, just look past it. Um, but again, my name is Sarah Brace. I'm the readmissions clinical analyst here at Luminous Health and the project manager behind remote patient monitoring. Next slide. So a bit about Luminous Health. So we're the third busiest hospital in Maryland. Um, we, uh, we specialize in, in orthopedics, cancer care, um, and we are, are one of our most notable um, accolades is that we deliver a kindergarten class full of babies every day. So um, lots, lots of uh, exciting things happening here at Anne Arundel. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background, uh, why, why we even started remote patient monitoring um, and, and kind of what we're doing moving forward. Uh, so back in March uh, with our first surge, uh, the hospital was granted a thousand of these devices uh, from an FCC grant. Um, and the original thought was, we can use this for surge capacity. We'll use these to monitor patients that may be out in our, our tents. Um, we may use these, um, you know, for patients that we've put into to alternate uh, care sites. Um, but in March and April, our surge, although great, uh, was one that we could handle in-house. So we were left with 1,000 Massimo devices, um, and a knock came on my office door in, in, a, in May, actually asking, you know, do we have any opportunities to repurpose these devices? And um, being involved in readmissions prevention, um, all the, the bells and whistles went off, and um, we moved forward with repurposing this device uh, instead for patients transitioning home uh, with, that have been diagnosed with COVID-19. So in June, uh, our first patients were sent home with remote patient monitoring and um, really um, the, our program sort of sets a patient up while they're, they're inpatient, takes care of all of the, the paperwork associated with it, consents and things like that. Uh, sets the bedside nurse sets the patient up with the device, make sure they're all connected. Um, and then the patient is sent home and, and told to wear the device. And um, our program differs a bit from, from Jody's and, and likely different from programs you've heard in the past. Um, our program monitors patients for a half an hour a day. And for the clinicians on the line, your, your spidey senses may be going off saying, a half an hour a day, what, what are you going to get out of that? Well, um, I, I will get to that in our success stories, but I think we've, we've really, um, we found a connection with our patients that we wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, and, and that connection is a daily phone call. So patient is sent home with their device, they wear it. Many of our patients wear it for much longer than a half an hour because as we've heard in previous presentations, um, these devices help ease anxiety. Uh, there's so many unknowns associated with COVID. Uh, so we, uh, this, uh, as I said before, patients oftentimes wear this a, a bit longer than a half an hour. Some of them wear it for a week straight. Um, but the premise behind our program is, is wearing the device once a day. Um, there's a check-in phone call that happens daily. Uh, we take vitals during that time. We'll, we obviously see them on the dashboard, ask patients a few questions, um, you know, primarily how you doing, do you need anything? Um, and there are oftentimes opportunities where um, we'll be talking to, to a patient who says, you know what, my brother just was diagnosed as well. Um, and we, at that point, can kind of 
swoop in and offer them a device um, if, need, if, if, you know, clinically indicated. Um, so we've been able to really connect with folks in a way that we haven't done traditionally in the past. Um, so uh, as I said, in, in, in June, we sent our first few patients home with remote patient monitoring and really have taken off since then. Uh, in July, we started offering this as an opportunity for patients who are referred from our clinical enterprise, so our ambulatory sites, um, to assist in ED diversion. Um, and then fast forward to November, so last month, um, uh, our second surge of hospitalized COVID patients resulted in uh, volumes of patients being sent home with remote patient monitoring surpassing our summer volumes combined. Um, so at, at uh, one uh, point in time, uh, three weeks ago, we were monitoring about 60 patients. Uh, but on average, and on any given day, if you look at our dashboard, we have about 30 active patients. Um, our readmit rate uh, ran that this morning. We're looking at about 7%. So um, this device is sent with all patients going home. So we're not sending skilled nursing facility patients home or patients going to assisted living. Um, but all patients going home, they're offered this device. And of course, it's, um, this is not something they, that they, it is mandatory, but it's certainly something that's recommended by their care team. So out of all of those patients that we have discharged home with this device, uh, we have about 7% of them returning. Next slide, please. This is um, my absolute favorite slide. I know it's awfully busy with pictures, um, but, but wanted to discuss with you our why. So there's the obvious reasons. Um, you know, we have COVID-19 patients that are, we're kind of bursting at the seams with. Um, we, you know, looking at decreasing our length of stay for COVID patients. Um, oftentimes, this, you know, offering this device to a patient will allow them to potentially go home maybe a day earlier or, or even a few hours earlier, which, which makes a huge difference with our patients. Um, this has also allowed us to build relationships. So uh, we're now part of a, a two hospital system and we have a, um, a, a great set of ambulatory providers that we work closely with. Um, but we've never worked in this capacity before, where we offer sort of bi-directional communication between the hospital, the doctor, the, uh, the patient, of course. Um, and then we introduce our uh, mobile integrated health teams. So in, in a couple of our uh, surrounding counties, we have groups of individuals uh, who work for our county EMS systems, uh, who are specifically handling uh, non-emergent scenarios. So um, our, uh, as I like to call them, our multi visit patients or familiar face patients, um, but maybe not necessarily COVID patients, um, these groups of individuals help intervene in a social setting and in a, and, um, in a medical way to help reduce the utilization of patients. So we've now introduced them into the fold for our COVID population. So these are trusted, of course, they're EMS professionals, they're, they're trusted individuals in folks' homes. So we have an opportunity, let's say a device is malfunctioning, which uh, really quite honestly doesn't happen as often as someone forgets their password or someone can't, you know, can't put up the device on themselves. Um, we can um, sort of, uh, you know, make a phone call, get our mobile integrated health team involved, go to visit a patient, um, or in, this, in the event that a patient is referred from one of our primary care offices, so they've never touched the hospital before. Um, instead of having them come into the uh, to an office to receive a device or drive somewhere, uh, we can have one brought to them, fully set up, um, and our our mobile integrated health teams are fully vetted with you know PPE and and um, everything that they need to be safe out in the community. But um, this has really allowed us to to better connect with our community in a way that we've never done before. Um, and my last bullet point under safe landing place, I can't impart this enough, has reduced the anxiety. It's reduced our patient anxiety. It's reduced their family's anxiety. It's reduced my anxiety. Um, our providers, our teams that are caring for these patients, this is an extra tool for them. Um, our, uh, for patients that are, have, are convalescing at home, they're able to do a telehealth visit with their provider and show them vital signs, or that provider can pull up that dashboard and see vital signs, which we didn't have available to us uh, pre-COVID. So um, just absolutely uh, a wonderful scenario for us. Um, and I wanted to talk about a, a couple good catches that I mentioned uh, before. So um, this has allowed us to detect small changes. So I'll run you through a very quick scenario with a patient who was on day three of being monitored um, and was 
typically upbeat and really kind of looked forward to that phone call every day from our primary care office checking in on them. And on day three, the patient sounded a little off. Um, and uh, I got a message um, saying, you know, this patient's pulse ox is um, in the 80s and I, you know, uh, the, the person on the phone had triaged them, had them do their deep breaths and coughing and, and all that good stuff and nothing seemed to work and they, they just seemed off. Uh, so at that point, of course, we um, pulled in our providers that, that uh, we have both advanced practice providers and uh, MDs that work on this project. So pulled them in um, and uh, immediately, all, all of us sort of had that gut feeling that something just wasn't right here. We referred the patient back to the ED and they ended up having uh, bilateral pulmonary embolisms, um, which, you know, as we know, can be a result of, of COVID. So um, this, you know, that, that uh, it's actually a medical assistant that made the phone call to the patient, noticed that change in their, their voice. And we, we certainly don't ask our medical assistants to do um, assessments on patients, um, but, you know, that's certainly just something that, you know, a human would pick up and um, we wouldn't have without Massimo, we wouldn't have found that we would, this, this person potentially could have passed away at home. This could have just been a disaster of a situation. Now the patient is, is fully recovered um, and is doing well at home with their family. So absolutely wonderful. Um, the next piece is reducing readmissions. Uh, so we have, you know, a, a, a large volume of patients that chronically readmit to the hospital. And some of these patients, unfortunately, um, have had COVID. Um, and those patients ordinarily would be returning back, especially with COVID and especially with those symptoms that get exacerbated. But again, having this device with them to reduce their anxiety has, has absolutely reduced um, our readmission rate for those, those particular folks. Um, and the last piece uh, that a uh, good catch is addressing social determinants of health. So we're having insight into patients in their homes that we, again, did, you know, did not ordinarily have. So we're able to uh, address a scenario where um, patient, uh, you know, all they had in their home when they came home from the hospital was cat food. Um, and we're able to get, again, with our mobile integrated health team, um, we're able to get, you know, Department of Aging involved. We're able to get uh, whatever sort of social service needs to be involved to kind of remedy the, the scenario um, and, and really, um, you know, get, get these patients what they need at the right place and at the right time. Next slide. The future state. Uh, so my the first piece for us is, is to continue to secure sustainable resources. So um, this project came together very quickly um, and with lots of different departments feeding in um, and offering um, different resources. And so moving forward, we'd like to build a more sustainable package with more consistent um, uh, rules for the employees that are involved. Um, we want to spread the word. This is this is how we're caring for patients, and and we're at the end of 2020. We're this is how we're caring for patients 2021 and beyond. Um, and our we want we we want our patients to know we care about them, and this is this is what we're doing. Um, we're also looking at improving ED, ED diversion uh, with these devices, um, chronic disease management, and and working with patients um, to hopefully prevent some post-surgical complications as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Massimo. This is um, it, it, this is, has been wonderful. I have uh, many of your employees on Speed Dial. You are all very responsive and have have made this uh, a great experience. And I look forward to our future working together. Sarah, well, I will say this on behalf of Massimo. We we absolutely look forward to working with you and your institution in the for in the forward years to come. A couple of things I want to call out specifically. One is. The no, noting your patient's anxiety levels in this period of time with social isolation, being able to check in is so incredibly important. And to have the clinical data to go along with that really gives you context that I think feeds right into what you were talking about with respect to the social determinants of health, that population health side that I think we really don't know what's going on in a patient's home, whether it be nutritional status, fluid balance, heart rate, pulse rate, uh, respiratory rate, et cetera, and now you have that line of sight, which is really powerful. Uh, the other piece is the, uh, the uh, detection of small changes that you noted. Really a, an incredibly powerful tool to have when you think about the ability to make changes on a dime. And in COVID-19, we know you could fall off a cliff with respect to oxygen saturation. Being able to act on that really does save lives. 
really fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. Let's go to the next slide, and I'm going to present our next uh, panelist, uh, Mitchell Fong. Uh, Mitch, Director of Telehealth at Renowned Health, is going to talk to us a lot about what's uh, happening there at Renowned, specifically in the telemedicine, telehealth front. Mitch. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, and thank you for all the other speakers. I think it's it's been really impactful and just great to hear the success stories that others are using technology to advance care and to really improve the patient journey. I think that's at the core and the forefront of really what I want to get across is what we're doing. It's for the patients and it's really the benefit for them. But the big question I get asked all the time from a telehealth perspective, and particularly now with how COVID has changed the healthcare landscape is, who is your vendor? And I personally hate that question. I hate the term vendor because to me, it's not what's the vendor, who's your vendor, what's the device, it's who's your partner. And at the forefront, it's finding the right partner that will be at the table with you to create the experience that you want for your patients, but also be mutually accountable for your goals and your development targets that you wanna have for your program. And I'll say from what I've heard from Sarah, Jody, and Dr. Pronovost, uh, it sounds like Massimo has been an amazing partner for them. And I'll get to sharing here how they've been an amazing partner for us on the Renown end. So as we move to the next slide, it's just highlighting a little bit of who are we at Renown? Um, where are we and what do we represent? And so at the center of everything we do is really the, the patient. And so we take that and we really build our models focused around the patient. Who is the patient and who is our population? Well, we're based out of Reno, Nevada. Um, when we look at that, between Sacramento, which is in Central California, kind of where those circles um, die off on the map on the left side, we actually span all the way across the state of Nevada to the eastern border um, to Salt Lake City. Between that area, there are zero level one um, trauma centers, and we are the only level two trauma center. That's over 100,000 square miles. So when we think about how has COVID impacted this community, well, 15 out of those counties in, in the state of Nevada are frontier, which is even less dense than rural. So we have to think about ways that we can help offset um, the impact to our inpatient settings and our acute settings by innovative ways. So moving to the next slide, it kind of highlights how did we get impacted by COVID during this time? Well, today, even today, we are seeing testing rates of positivity greater than 20% in our state. Um, we were seeing a huge influx of capacity. What we've had to do to meet the need starting in March is stand up an additional ICU, 45 bed ICU um, that we've stood up in addition. We've also expanded and created an alternate care site, which many of you may have seen in the news. Um, it's been getting a lot of national attention, but we've converted the first and second floor of our parking garage into an overflow COVID um, unit. And so really this is being used for patients that no longer require ICU level intensity, but are not quite ready to be discharged to the home with the level of support. So we put them into this unit, which is a negative pressure unit. That's kind of what you see on the right there, all those pipes. Um, it's a negative pressure unit. First floor, second floor, each have 700 beds for an 800 bed hospital. It's pretty remarkable that we were able to get that in and built in 10 days. Um, so it's been pretty amazing. But what we've had to do, very similar to the Baptist Health Team and Jody, we've been on divert many times. And so we're really thinking about how do we create the right access? How do we see patients better? How do we create um, the opportunity in our ICUs so that we can treat those patients that really need it the most? And that's where we've partnered with Mossimo and leveraged multiple tools, but Mossimo Safety Net has been one of the strongest solutions for us. And so what you see here on the pictures, it's kind of what the inside of that parking garage really looks like. Again, we don't have pictures of our patients just for HIPAA and compliance reasons, um, but we do have active patients in there. Generally, we're seeing a panel of about 20 to 50 patients per day right now, expecting that to ramp up, and we're discharging 10 to 30 patients from that unit every day. So you can imagine there's a pretty high turnover of patients coming in and out of that unit. So moving to the next slide to kind of highlight how else did we respond to COVID, particularly with telehealth? Well, for us, we saw a huge influx in growth in virtual services. We had a demand that we had to meet. So we stood up virtual visits for every single specialty and office across the entire health system. Pre-COVID, we had about 20 plus different specialties delivering outpatient telemedicine. 
But during COVID, we really had to stand this up for all of them. So now every specialty office, every primary care, every urgent care and ED um, has the ability to deliver telemedicine via virtual visits. Uh, we also have stood up acute consults so that our providers can, whether they are in COVID um, quarantine or there's just a need to be restricted from that patient, we have the ability to beam into that room and do our rounding virtually. Um, we're also rolling that out in a pilot phase to partner hospitals around the rural community so we can do that as well. But really, we've seen a huge influx, anywhere between 10 to 20 times the volume in telehealth based on the month. And um, we got to this place where we're at such a high capacity, we had to figure out how do we start transitioning the patients so they can begin their recovery at home and the transition back to their normal life safely and with the right support. And I love what Sarah said earlier. It's a, it's a more than just the physical needs they have, but the emotional needs and the responsive the responsiveness to be able to make them feel comfortable and supported in their home. So going to that next slide, um, we we started to use the Mossimo safety net in November of this year. So we're a later starter than many of the other presenters here, um, but we used it primarily based out of the inpatient setting today. We have ambitions and we have workflows to enroll patients from the urgent care and from the ED as a diversion program. But because we really wanted to get a pilot phase started, go th work through all the kinks for us, we were um, excited about doing this from an inpatient setting. So this way we can confirm and set up those patients from that parking garage, from that alternate care site. Um, we, we set them up with these devices as we know that they're approaching readiness for discharge, um, generally the morning of or the night before discharge. That way we can get them used to the technology, ensure they're used to using the device on their phone, the application, and also ensure that our monitoring team is comfortable with that patient and all the results are being fed. Um, and so what we're doing is we're using both the radius PPG, which is your pulse ox sensor, as well as the radius T, which is a, um, a chest strip that monitors the temperature. We're using those in combination to monitor our patients so we can have continuous uh, monitoring for four metrics, that's respiratory rate, pulse rate, um, oxygen saturation, and their temperature. We're discharging patients with anywhere from zero to four liters worth of oxygen support. And really the benefits we're seeing besides length of stay is capacity. Um, but really from the patient perspective, it's the comfort, the ability to limit exposure and the ability to transition to your normal life. Next slide, please. And so here's a, a highlight of kind of what's our workflow. How did we get to this? It's not just one team. It takes a whole host of people to really make this work. And so we've built out an algorithm that has inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, very similar to what Jody shared from Baptist Health. We really wanted to make it restrictive at first. And I'll say that the reason for doing that is we believe that every product will continue to grow. And so with that, we evaluate this twice a week. We have a committee that reviews our processes, our issues, patient complaints, and opportunities for continued improvement, um, whether it's workflow, technology, et cetera. And with that, we've continued to make serious changes and improvement with our platform. And the Massimo team can probably speak to it. I'm on the line with them multiple times a week as a part of this process to make sure that, again, as partners, we are working together to achieve the mission and to give that patient experience that we want to have. So moving to the next slide, just, just kind of highlights what's the escalation path. You know, there's those metrics that we're looking at on a continuous basis. But what do we do if an alert is triggered? How do we respond? And how do we, what are your triggers? Um, and so happy to speak to anybody that has questions or concerns about this offline. Happy to share it. Uh, and one thing that's been beautiful with working with Massimo is the ability to work with their other partners. Um, this probably looks very familiar to you, Dr. Pronovos, because we met with you and we discussed and learned from you how you guys were using this and what type of escalation pathways you guys had. Um, and I think that's re really gave us the framework to get started, but for allow us to customize it for our patient, our population and our needs. And so finally moving to the next slide, it's a little bit about what's kind of been our experience so far. Well, uh, our average daily census, and I took this based on the last two weeks, based on when we were at more of a full capacity, it's been 35 patients per day that we're monitoring. Average length this day is somewhere around six days. Again, these are patients that were inpatient and in a, in a ICU status typically prior to their discharge. 
And so um, we're not as concerned as monitoring them longer than 10 to 14 days um, because we feel like with with one week of monitoring, we're going to get to that day four, day 10 spikes that we see with COVID. And that's kind of similar to the bounce back rate at 20%, a little bit higher than Dr. Pronovost. But for us, we're discharging 85% of the patients we discharge are on oxygen support. Some of them have not hit that day 10. So a, a piece of that is what we believe is kind of expected bounce backs, knowing the condition, knowing that day 10 spike. But with the program, we've seen, again, uh, we're, we're recently started in the last month, but over 90% of the patients have said they would recommend this to their family or friends. And I think that's a testament to how great the product is. A lot of them state that the app is very useful, user-friendly, but a couple of success stories here. We had a patient that was discharged on the program. Um, they had some alerts triggered based on our physician interaction. They decided that we were gonna recommend you to come in. Patient was really opposed to come in, felt like they didn't want to. Um, but, you know, our provider was able to gently encourage them to come in. And based on that, we were able to diagnose a cardiac issue that needed immediate intervention. And um, the patient stated that if they did not get encouraged by that provider to come in, they would have slept through it. And who knows what would have happened to them. Another patient um, was believed completely that they would not be home for Thanksgiving. And we didn't even realize that the day before Thanksgiving was a wife's birthday. And so it was just amazing the fact that we were able to get this patient discharged the day before Thanksgiving as one of the early starters on this program and to have this device and the oxygen support. He actually called us during his virtual visit and was crying thanking us for that he can even be at home to celebrate his birthday and to celebrate Thanksgiving with his wife and family. Um, and that to me is so meaningful on what that patient experience is like. Um, but from a clinical standpoint, what we can do, because we do have very similar to what Sarah was saying with that daily check-in, we have a daily virtual check-in with our providers that's um, monitoring the patient and overseeing that. And so when they're getting ready to discharge them, they actually can use the continuous monitoring dashboard. They ask the patient to do a six minute walk test in place and they can monitor their O2 levels based on that um, to determine if it drops below a level what's not safe for discharge. And so that's a part of the discharge process that we can do remotely. Um, but overall, I think this quote on the side is just something that we want to share about the patient survey. And for us, next steps, it's, again, expanding it to our rural partners, expanding it to um, enrolling patients from the ED and urgent care, adding multiple languages to this, because for us, we start with English only. And then really thinking about this continuous monitoring being the foray into hospital at home, which is what we believe, as Dr. Pronovost kind of said, is the future of healthcare is really moving this continuous monitoring to hospital at home. So thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate sharing our experience here um, and partnering with you guys at Massimo. So Rick, I'll turn it back to you. Mitch, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation. And as you said, care in the home, absolutely nothing can beat that. And when you actively and passively acquire the level of parameters you have done utilizing the Massimo Safety Net, it gives you that confidence that allows you to, again, have line of sight on that patient give them the reduction in anxiety that Sarah talked about, understand the readmission component that Jody talked about as well. Really fantastic. Looking forward to the clinical outcomes associated with the data you're collecting. So um, next slide, please. Uh, as we wrap up uh, today's webinar, I thought I would reflect on a couple of things and then uh, ask Dr. Pronovost to weigh in. First, thematically, this red thread that has come through everything, it really goes beyond surge capacity. So quickly responding by taking non-monitored areas, non-clinical areas, and having them retrofitted immediately so that they could handle a higher, higher acuity patient. This obviously is field hospitals, or in Mitch's case, even parking lots, tremendous. But taking that into the home, really it's beyond the next frontier, we're doing it today. What we do next there is gonna be so powerful with respect to post-surgical care, chronic conditions, CHF, COPD, et cetera. And of course, having the wellness component to close that continuum and also looking for areas where we can intervene effectively like uh, opioid-induced respiratory depression associated with patients being discharged on opioids. Very, very powerful. We're working on all of that. So with this, this red thread, this theme, Dr. Pronovost, I wanna have you reflect on our presentation, what our speakers have said, what you've personally done with the Safety Net platform, uh, obviously at university hospitals, but even in your mind's eye, what's around the corner?
are great stories and you see many, many similar themes. But let me put it into context, maybe at the broader national scale. But, you know, just last week, we published a paper in New England Journal Catalyst showing that defects in value cost the U.S. healthcare system over $1.4 trillion a year. These are defects where we know we should be doing something where we're not. One of the biggest categories of defects was caring for people in a more costly, often lower quality setting than needed, whether that's skilled nursing facility, whether that's a hospital, whether that's an ED visit. Massimo is one of the few technologies, which you heard, that actually improves every component of the value equation. That is, it's higher quality, it's much better experience for patients uh, and the caregivers, and the experience is greatly enhanced by those callbacks that patients really, really love that nurturing, being cared for feeling, and it's ridiculously lower cost, about 20x lower cost of caring at home and not in the hospital. You're spot on. This is much more than about surge capacity. Now it's literally thinking, how do I give hospital level care, ICU level care in the home, and what do I need to do that that safely? I know you're. I don't think it's approved yet, but your uh, remote blood pressure monitoring is going to be an essential component of this armamentarium because once you add that, we just automated nursing vital signs for free. I mean, think about that in a patient's home that you can have that degree. We can offer high flow oxygen in the home because we're monitoring them continuously. So what I think the future is really only constrained by our own innovation and ideas that we should just think of the hospital, I mean, the home as where we can give hospital and ICU level care and continue this breathtaking innovative innovation that you heard from the other panelists today about different use cases that we could explore. Thank you so much Thank for you. those comments. I think that uh, you're, obviously, you're calling out the economics associated with it. Clearly, the arcane uh, reimbursement codes are being addressed and care in the home is going to be part of that, which is going to open up tremendous opportunities for our clinicians, our providers, but I think for patients to get a level of care in a safe environment because, as we've said, clinicians will have a line of sight on them in the home because a platform like our safety net will be there to deliver that high quality, high fidelity, again, uh, access to the patient's clinical data. Fantastic comments. I want to uh, see if I can get to a couple of questions quickly before we uh, call off here. The first one is with respect to the difference that it makes in nursing workflow and what is needed from a resource perspective uh, to care for these patients remotely. Does it help or does it hurt? Who could, uh, who'd be open to taking that? I can take that question. Can you hear me? Yes, please. No, definitely. I think it, it's definitely an added bonus to have a nurse there because they can speak the language to the patient. Um, they know the ins and outs of caring for patients, and, and they can basically conceptualize what the patient is explaining to them, and they'll be able to guide them better. So I think it definitely helps to have an RN or some clinical person there on the other line of um, taking that call for that patient. Yeah, Rick, and I'm not sure about the case. I would just add for nursing workload, the usability is so high, and, and Jody, please correct me. In our shop, it's probably two minutes, three minutes at the amount of work. It, it's not very much burdensome at all. And the nurse is talking and educating the patient when they do that. The, at our place, the monitoring, that's a separate role. So we have a separate nursing team that is overseeing the monitoring. They don't have other duties in the ED or the ICU uh, because we have such a high volume of patients. Correct. You definitely have to have two separate roles. You would have to have someone in a monitoring center, which we use a transfer center for our monitoring, and then we also have the bedside nurse who um, attaches a patient to the device. So that would be two separate entities for us. And with that being said, the nurse at the bedside, initially it took them some time, but once they got very comfortable with it, under 15 minutes, they had the patient hooked up and ready to go. So it's, it's very feasible to attain in a short period of time if you have the right trained um, people working with your patient. Fantastic. One other uh, observation, I know that in the inpatient setting, certainly with uh, COVID-19, 
the need to reduce unnecessary contact with patients is really, really important. And having uh, patients in isolation, like Mitch said with his uh, uh, positive negative pressure rooms, really important not to be able to disturb the patient or really expose other individuals. I think that's important when we come to home care. Do you see this in other chronic conditions really playing a role in those patients beyond COVID-19? Yeah, I, yeah, I guess yeah. I'll take a stab at this one first. I absolutely do. I think when we think about the opportunity to continuously monitor patients for other conditions, I think it's vast. Uh, as Dr. Pronova said, I think when we think about many conditions, um, for us, just things that come to mind very briefly is, you know, pulmonary rehab, cardiac rehab. I think these are just low-hanging fruit for this type of technology to be able to monitor them. Um, and even if they do have an issue today, you do a virtual visit, but you don't have that ability to check in on some of their vitals. If you had this technology and you were able to monitor that and have that access to it when you're, you know, when the patient is experiencing something, you can really be much more proactive in the care. And I believe that gives you the opportunity as providers to, to do much more with it. Uh, and so I think we're looking at exploring other opportunities for multiple conditions to be able to roll these type of devices out. I'm really excited about the continuous. So that's kind of uh, my perspective on that. And, and Rick, I would just add, I, we haven't even explored the full benefits. I'll give you an example. There's compelling literature that sleep deprivation in the hospital or ICU is a major cause of delirium and actually you know, much worse outcomes. So imagine how much better people are going to be sleeping in their own bed and not getting woken up at night and wearing their own snuggly pajamas instead of these, you know, it's itchy hospital gowns. Like, I, I think we're just scratching the surface of how great it is to keep people in their home. Yeah, I would echo that. I would say one of the things that um, I've really enjoyed and the feedback that patients have given us is, you know, it's often overlooked the comfort level of just being at home, using your own shower, um, being in your own kitchen, sitting on your own sofa. And when you're in isolation and you're sitting at home by yourself all day long, um, to be on your own sofa, your own TV, that means a lot for some of these patients, maybe even more than we realize. And so I assume that's going to continue into the future as we see it continue to evolve. One last question. Uh, there's been mention of confident discharge over and over during this presentation. Will there be any util utility for the platform in those patients because of the, the opening up of codes in ASCs going home to add confidence in doing more complex procedures in AFC. Yeah, Rich, what I would, I would think you're gonna see, as I mentioned, any a defect is in value, or one of the defects is getting care in a higher cost setting than you need to. So I would envision in the future, we will be deploying this from skilled nursing facilities or alternative to go home from ASCs. I mean, I think you will see it continually across any of the acute inpatient facilities um, or ambulatory surgery centers as an alternative to an inpatient stay. Fantastic. Well, I think we're at time well, now. Time. And I want to, on behalf of our CEO and founder, Joe Kiani, our COO, Bilal Musin, thank everyone for attending the webinar, particularly our panelists, for your insight regarding your individual and organization's collective efforts to not only address COVID-19, this pandemic, but also looking around the corner to what's next and how you could actively today deploy technology and leverage that information in the betterment of the folks we all collectively serve. Again, I'm, I'm pleased to be here today with this esteemed panel. I thank you all for attending and look forward to our next webinar where we'll continue the theme moving forward with respect to Massimo Safety Net. Thank you.